Welcome, folks. Thank you for joining us uh, once again for our honors program uh, colloquium series. Um, I'm going to announce the, uh, the next talk that we're going to have uh, after spring break, then I'll introduce our speaker. On uh, the 22nd of March, the information's in the chat for those of you who are uh, following along in real time. From 12.15 to 1 over in University Center Room 217, our honors student Marcos Revilla will be presenting How to Buy a Truck, A New Way to Find a Deal. Uh, this is one of the honors projects that he worked on, so that should be very interesting. And that'll be done both in the classroom in 217 and over Zoom, um, so you may attend however you like. But uh, today, I'm very happy to uh, welcome back one of our colleagues who uh, gave us a talk in uh, in the fall, so a uh, spring encore, Dr. M.D. Nizam Udin, who's Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering here at AM Texarkana, is going to be speaking to us on perspectives in, per, perspectives, sorry, and challenges of nanomaterials-based solid state hydrogen storage for fuel cell applications. So uh, go ahead and keep your mics muted. Dr. Uh, Dean is speaking, and uh, we should have some time for questions at the end. If you do have questions during the talk, feel free to put them in the chat. So with that, I will be quiet and I will turn it over to Dr. Udine. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Everybody, can you hear me? Okay, good. How are you guys doing today? Everybody okay? Good? Super duper. Had uh, coffee in the honor suite, so. <laughs> Is it still everywhere? I can come after this. Oh, yeah. Now there should be some left. You're welcome. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this session. Uh, I am uh, M. Mohammed Nizamuddin, uh, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, today, I will uh, briefly talk about our perspective and uh, challenges of nanomaterial-based solid-state hydrogen storage for fuel cell application. Uh, this is the outline of, of my talk. Uh, I will uh, introduce, briefly introduce about uh, hydrogen storage material system, especially metal hydride. Uh, renewable energy. I will also talk about a uh, little bit about renewable energy, uh, greenhouse gas emission, uh, fuel cell vehicle, uh, thermochemical energy storage system, its principle. And I did some study in this area. Still, uh, I am working on this field. This is my current project. Uh, metal hydride for hydrogen storage. I will uh, briefly talk about that. My uh, experimental works and some findings, and lastly, a conclusion and references. Uh, this is my motivation. Let me share uh, you guys one nice information. If you drive a car for 300 miles, you need only four to five uh, kg of hydrogen. Compared to gasoline, if you compare this quantity with gasoline, that is only one third of gasoline. But why we are not using hydrogen in our automobile sector? There are some challenges. Still, uh, uh, we can overcome those challenges. For storing this four to five kg of hydrogen at atmospheric condition, atmospheric pressure and temperature, I need 60 cubic meter space. That's the big challenges. This 60 cubic meter, that's almost three times the volume of the car. Now finding some material system that can store hydrogen, and we can use that hydrogen uh, on board application, that's my interest. If we look at these uh, images here, uh, the bigger one, this big cylinder, uh, same volume of hydrogen is stored here at 200 bar, almost 200 times it's compressed. Com we need this much big cylinder, storing hydrogen. If, if we compress at 200 bar, same volume of hydrogen, we can store it in liquid form. The second one from the right, the second one, the hydrogen in liquid form. Same volume of hydrogen, if I like to store it in material system in solid state form, like some uh, lanthanum nickel hydride or magnesium-based 
alloy system, you see, I need a lesser space. A lot of room, space here, uh, people are actually, a lot of research are working in this area, uh, finding some material system that can store hydrogen and that can release hydrogen in solid form at higher storage efficiency or also uh, uh, releasing efficiency, that is uh, charging and recharging. It's similar to like our mobile battery. When uh, we are charging, right, the battery and also we are using that again, we are charging, charging and recharging. The idea is like this, making something similar to our mobile battery so that we can use this in large scale. If you can manufacture it, we can use this in the automobile sector. This is my interest working in this area. Now look at some uh, global uh, energy system. If you look at this diagram, uh, the first 2010 to 2020, uh, this data, the actual data. And from 2020 to 20, 2050, over the 30 years, this is the project, projected data. This is not the actual data. If you look at this, over the time, the nuclear energy, coal-based energy, natural gas, petroleum, and other liquid uh, renewable energy, it's over the time is increasing. And US EIA, it's project that by 2050, almost 50% increase in world energy use will be using more than 50% increase after 30 years. This is the 30 years time projection. Think about this. If we increase using uh, our gasoline or other energy, how much we are producing the uh, greenhouse gases. Think about our environmental system. We need to focus on using more renewable energy that carbon emission is zero, that is a renewable, uh, cheaper source of energy. Now, uh, this graph is showing the global greenhouse gas emission by different economic sector. If we look at this, the electricity and heat production, it's contribute around 20%, 25% greenhouse gas emission. Agriculture and forestry and other land use, it's 24%, building 6%, transportation 14%, industry 21%, and other energy, you, other energy, it's contribute 10% greenhouse gas emission. Now, if we can, in the transportation sector, it's con contribute 14% greenhouse gas in the environment. If we can reduce, we can cut down the gasoline uses, if we can use more renewable energy, in the transportation sector, then we can reduce these greenhouse gas emission in this sector. Now this diagram, the right side diagram, this diagram is showing uh, the emission in million metric ton over 1992, 90, 2018, the data. You see Asia, Asia, East Asia and Pacific, Europe and Central Asia, United States, also a little bit high, but other countries, Middle East and North America, Latin America, Africa, Canada, South Asia, they are producing more uh, greenhouse gases. That is the big threat for our environment. Now, hydrogen in the transportation sector, the major fuel we use in the transportation, that is the transportation sector, that is the gasoline, the petroleum we use, every day we use, that is 89% of the total fuel use. We, everybody know about the fuel crisis, right? And also the greenhouse gases. That is the big threat, as I said. Now we need to find, we need to do some research. We need to develop some alternative vehicle system that can use renewable energy with a higher efficiency. In the same time, it's a couple of decades people develop this battery electric vehicle, hybrid vehicle, also fuel cell vehicle. People already developed this, but, but still we need to develop further in this area. Today, my talk is uh, basically for the 
uh, hydrogen storage material, solid state hydrogen storage for the fuel cell vehicle. Now, this is a nice uh, um, images here. This is showing different comp comparison. If you look, look at this hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, it's a bit expensive at this, at this time. The currency is in uh, European currency that is in Euro, 60,000, but its emission is steam only. If we look the electric vehicle, it's still expensive, 21,000 Euro, and emission is none. There is no carbon emission, no greenhouse gas emission. However, our petrol and diesel vehicle we are using every day, it's, it's not expensive, but emission, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, not only this, there are some other sulfur oxide, different types of oxide, that's emission, that's a big threat for the environment. This hydrogen fuel cell or electric, they have zero emission. In the near future, I hope people will develop some material system. We will see hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle uh, for uh, light and heavy duty vehicle, train, ship, train, and drones. In the United States already, uh, uh, people are using hydrogen for in aviation application. We will see uh, hydrogen will be used for train, ship, also other drone and other uh, many different application. It's possible, we can use hydrogen. It's a renewable energy. We can produce hydrogen with very cheap technology. We, can, we need to develop some cheap technology so, so that we can use, uh, produce hydrogen. And also compared to gasoline, petroleum, hydrogen energy density is very high. Now, this two figure actually it's compared the efficiency of a battery vehicle and fuel cell vehicle. The left one uh, is showing uh, the battery vehicle for different component efficiency of uh, different component like grid, charger, charging system, motor, inverter. But final efficiency for battery vehicle is 71%. On the right side one, this is the efficiency for different component. Final efficiency is 10%. Actually, uh, it's a quite old data. Uh, some people claim the fuel cell vehicle, its efficiency is around 25 to 35%, not 10%, 25 to 35%. But still, we need to work in this area. We can develop, we can increase its efficiency like 70, 80, 80%. Now, this diagram is showing a uh, basic working principle of a fuel cell vehicle. Um, basically, the fuel cell vehicle, it's use a electrochemical engine to produce power. It's a electrochemical engine. And in that, hydrogen is used as a fuel. Hydrogen, here you, you can see the hydrogen tank, stored hydrogen. Now, the fuel cell is uh, receiving hydrogen from the hydrogen tank and it's receiving oxygen from the air. Combining this oxygen and hydrogen, it produces power and release water and heat. That power we use to run this motor. These are the uh, very simple basic principle of fuel cell vehicle. But hydrogen storage here, that play an important game here, hydrogen storage. The way you, hydro, uh, you are getting, you're supplying hydrogen from the fuel cell, Actually, the efficiency of the fuel cell largely depend on the storage system of the hydrogen. We need to develop this area. At moment, we can store hydrogen in liquid form. We can store hydrogen in complex gas form, or we can store hydrogen by chemically or physically attaching with material, like solid state material. These, these are the area, if we can focus on this area, if we do a lot of uh, work and we get a lot of development in this area, then we can use hydrogen for onboard application. Now, this figure is showing a uh, different hydrogen storage system. Uh, the top one is showing the physical storage. Uh, let's look at this, uh, the top one. If, if we store hydrogen at one bar pressure, uh, we can store only 
1.3 gram hydrogen in per liter, one liter volume. If I increase this pressure 150 bar, uh, in that case, I can store only 10 gram hydrogen per liter volume area. Further increasing the pressure compression, if I compress more, in that case, I can store only 28 gram, 350 bar pressure. If I increase more, about 700 times atmospheric pressure, uh, then I can store as much 40 gram hydrogen per liter. But liquid hydrogen, it's 71 gram. The problem is with liquid hydrogen, uh, it's a very low temperature. You see here 20 Kelvin, that is around uh, negative 250 uh, temperature. On board application, it's quite impossible. However, if we, if we use some material-based storage system uh, like interstitial, interstitial hydride, uh, interspace between the metal atom, if we can store hydrogen here, uh, we can store 100 to 150 gram. If you use complex hydride, we can store 70 to 150 gram hydrogen. Chemical storage it is giving 70 to 150 solvent based on water. My interest is in this area, material based interstitial hydride. If, you, if we can store uh, hydrogen in interspace between metallic atom and we can get atom, uh, we can get that hydrogen, we can use it uh, in automobile sector and other different application. Let's look at uh, the advantages and disadvantages uh, using different uh, material based system. We can store hydrogen by physically attached with the material it's i mentioned here physically bound hydrogen or chemically bound hydrogen can make chemical bond with the metal chemically bond, bound hydrogen i mentioned those things for physically attached if you want to attach physically with the material system we can use carbon nanotube or other carbon structure we can use zeolite we can use metal organic frameworks people already uh, developed this uh, th this material system the study, the performance of this material. We can see here the storage capacity for carbon nanotube or other carbon structure only 5.8%. If you use geomide, the storage capacity is 2.198%. Metal organic frameworks, it storage capacity is high, but still it's 4.5%. Look at the operating condition. For carbon nanotube, other carbon nanostructure is 77 Kelvin. Pisha look at 4200 bar. Geovite is 77 Kelvin. It's very low temperature. If we attach chemically, chemically bound hydrogen, there are some a lot of met metal hydride people are trying working in this area. Its storage capacity is 5.4%. If we use magnesium-based alloy, but look at the operating condition for charging and discharging hydrogen. It's 300 degrees Celsius and atmosphere one at one bar pressure. Pressure is okay here, but uh, temperature is still a bit high. We need to find some material that can store hydrogen and release hydrogen at atmospheric condition. That is my interest, my goal. Uh, this diagram is showing some example of material-based hydrogen storage system. We have chemisorption, fissiorption, fissiorption. Uh, for this, we have intermetallic compound. We can use different intermetallic compound. We have different chemical hydride. We can uh, also use magnesium-based alloy. For complex hydride, we can use some borohydride or nitride. These are some of the example of hydride material that we can use for hydrogen storage. For physically attached, we can use different types of metal organic frameworks, carbon nanotube, metal dope CNT, geolite, or some covalent organic framework. Uh, do you guys have any question up to now? Are you guys okay? Yeah, I don't see any in the chat so far. So uh, yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Dr. Kalam had one. Sorry, go ahead. We, we are good. I see we are good. Okay. Okay. And now this figure is showing the uh, density. Hydrogen storage density, if you look, uh, 
the surface ab absorption intermetallic hydride or complex hydride, chemical hydride, it's um, is hydrogen storage density is very high. If you, if you select material, some chemical hydride. Now, the hydrogen storage, hydrogen charging and discharging in the in solid material system, its principle is similar as thermochemical energy storage system. I think uh, whoever have uh, chemistry, taken chemistry courses, I think uh, they can understand easily the working principle of hydrogen, uh, solid state hydrogen state is similar to this. It's, it's a reversible endothermic and exothermic reaction. Hydrogen is storage to the material and releasing hydrogen from the material. It's a reversible endothermic and exothermic reaction. First steps to look at we uh, have. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt uh, here. Uh, so, uh, reversible endo and exo meaning forward is endo or exo? Releasing is endo or exo? Releasing is energy output, that is exo. Exo, okay, thank you. I am just telling you, if you just give heat energy input, then you are releasing hydrogen. If you give hydrogen input, you are releasing heat. That simply, uh, it works this way. Okay. The first so step release, is- Releasing would be exo, uh, endo, sorry. Releasing would be endo. Okay. Okay, the charging stress, first step is the charging stress, endothermic reaction like this. We have uh, uh, A, B, let's say for example, now we are giving energy input, the charging stress, then it is storage. Uh, the, the product is storing that energy. And then in the di discharging stage, exothermic reaction between A and B, and then it releases the en energy. It's similar to this way, the hydrogen storage works like this. We have a metal hydride bed or some uh, solid material. Now I am giving its hydrogenation process, it's called hydrogenation. I am giving hydrogen input in this metal hydride bed. The metal hydride bed receive a, a, its hydrogen and then it releases some heat. Now, if I give some heat input here, the, the metal hydride will release hydrogen. This is the process how it works. Now, how we can integrate this metal hydride, the fuel cell, it's a very simple thing. Uh, we can easily integrate uh, metal hydride in the fuel cell. Metal hydride, with, metal hydride will release hydrogen. The fuel cell will receive that hydrogen. It will produce energy and its output will be the waste heat. That heat we can use again to release hydrogen from the metal hydride. And this diagram uh, is showing uh, the hydrogen cycle uh, with uh, no net carbon dioxide emission. If we look at this, we can, I can start from here by electrolysis process from water, we can produce hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen, oxygen it goes to the environment and hydrogen, we can store that hydrogen in some suitable material system. From here, from that material, using that stored hydrogen, I can run engine or other system that will, from there, I can again get water, the output the water. This water, again, I can use for hydrogen production. It's, this is a hydrogen cycle. It's not producing any greenhouse gases. Now, my idea is this, by selecting some suitable metal hydride bed, if I can combine some uh, graphene or carbon 60, some suitable polymer CNT or aerogel, or if, if I can combine them and fabricate some material system like this, I'm expecting uh, this way, the reaction kinetic will be high, the storage capacity and releasing capacity will be high at uh, atmospheric temperature and pressure. This is my idea. And I did some study, I fabricated some material system. Um, start, I started with the PMMA and PDF, some polymer I dissolved in, uh, I am going a little bit faster uh, in DMF and then sonicate it for certain time. I added, uh, uh, graphene or other carbon-based material, uh, proof sonication, and then I added 
lanthanum nickel metal hydride in that in that mixture in that solution and then i shear mix it for four uh, four hours after shear mixing to make sure all the metal hydride are uniformly distributed of the carbon particle are uniformly distributed in the solution then i heat, heat cast it for the uh, 150 celsius for 24 hours these are the encapsulated lanthanum nickel and carbon based metal hydride polymeric composite it's a, it's a composite material then i tested uh, this material it's a uh, uh, we I, I use tpd or tds it's for temperature program dehydrogenation experiment i tested its uh, hydrogen storage capacity and hydrogen release capacity uh, this diagram is showing some uh, SCM images basically it's uh, it's some polymer and network with uh, metal hydride and carbon nanoparticle. Does anybody have any question uh, up to now? No, I think we're good. Okay, then this is the conclusion. Actually, um, um, I am not showing uh, many results here. Uh, just simple, some simple, giving some brief idea, some knowledge about it. I use vanthanum uh, nickel uh, nano, nano crystal structure, and from the ACM images, I did some other characterization process. I'm not showing here. Uh, it make a good interface with the polymer, and the higher surface area of the polymer and carbon-based particle, and that substantially increase the cyclic stability during the charging and discharging process for the hydrogen charging and hydrogen releasing. And I, I used two different material, multi-wall carbon nanotube and graphene sheet. Uh, in that case, multi-wall carbon nanotube, it's a hollow structure and it increased better reaction kinetics than graphene. And this is one uh, example of hydrogenation process at 19 degrees Celsius temperature, room temperature, uh, the hydrogen storage capacity for one of my samples I, I mentioned here, EPMC4, is 1.058%. That means if you have one kg hydrogen, hydro, if you have one kg of this material system, at least you can store one kg hydrogen in that uh, at 19 degree, that is room temperature atmospheric pressure. It's fiber, it's a little bit higher, higher pressure, but uh, I need to work in this area to make this fiber just only one bar, atmospheric pressure. Then only uh, I can claim, okay, this material you can use for onboard application. Uh, that's all, I guess that's all, this is my references I use. Any question? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Udin. Excellent. I finished by 30 minutes, I guess. Oh, I yeah. love it. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Time. Um, so if you do have questions, uh, feel free to uh, unmute. And if you want, put your camera on and, uh, and go ahead and ask them. Um, yeah, I'll just open it up to the floor. Who wants to, who wants to ask? No question from me, though I am a chemist here, but uh, I question what I had, I asked already along the, I mean, lecture. Uh, that's when it's a nice project, definitely, I must say. And uh, uh, I, I, I would say uh, I am, I can claim that I am the only audience who understood the best here. <laughs> Probably. It's, that's true. correct. That's <laughs> correct. I like to I like to give one information here. Actually, thermal energy, the charging and discharging process in this area, people define in different way. Thermal energy or removal of hydrogen to and from the metal bed is called charging. Right. If you give thermal energy, that is the charging stroke. If you give thermal energy input, you are you are receiving hydrogen, and if you give hydrogen input, you are getting thermal energy output that is called discharging. It's a conflicting this time. Now, to, to me, it is it is here the picture or or this showing. It's uh, I mean uh, the chemistry language is saying clearly like that from left to right. The way it is written, it yeah. is an exothermic process uh, from left to right. 
uh, that is uh, the uh, you are charging the hydrogen uh, that i understand the way yes. it is a picture yeah, so yeah, yeah. charging uh, hydrogen like a language here so it is charging that hydrogen it is an exothermic process reverse whenever it is discharging it looks like it is an endothermic process yeah that's correct yeah so that's uh, that's why uh, uh, you uh, it looks to me you try to fit that same meaning in one line that was confusing whenever you, you say that uh, that line was it is reversible into an exo so that is that was confusing language for me in this area i saw many of the uh, people uh, they are defining this way i am also a bit confused about why they are defining based on this diagram and this language it's a little bit conflict yeah I understand this, uh, but uh, in the literature, people, I so, think a chemistry uh, expert guy, they can better understand than me. As a psychologist, I don't know much about endo and endo, endo and exothermic. I do know about endomorphs and exomorphs. I can tell you a lot about that. But um, my question has to do with um, where do you see the barriers to um, first of all, creation of um, technologies that that will make this practical slash um, affordable slash efficient. The main problem here is the hydrogen storage. Uh, if I go here, here, right? The hydrogen storage is the main barrier. We need to overcome this. How we can store hydrogen? There are a couple of ways. We can store it in the liquid form, compressed form. The liquid form, if you store it, you have to maintain the cryogenic temperature. Right. Uh, that is negative temperature, negative 250 or more. Right. But onboard application, maintaining the temperature, it's a, technologically, it's a little bit harder on board application. Another thing, you can compress gas, hydrogen gas. If you compress 700 times or more, it's like, a, it's like if it bursts, it's like a bomb, right? It's high pressurized gas. Another negative point is if you compress more, hydrogen is losing its efficiency. You are losing the efficiency. Now, people came, to try storing hydrogen in solid form, right? Like this is a battery, this is the battery. I wanna store hydrogen here. I wanna receive hydrogen from here also. The thing is, you can physically attach it, like Van der Waals force, you can physically attach it or you can make chemical bonding with this. The main barrier is if you chemically bond hydrogen atom, with a metallic bond, how are we gonna get that hydrogen? You need to supply some heat. Mm. That's the main barrier. Okay. I can easily store it. I can make good bonding with other material system. I can make it, but right. you need to break that bond to get release of that hydrogen. And that takes energy. That takes energy. Yeah, right. This is the so... main barrier. So it sort of starts to, it, the efficiency works against itself then at that point. Yes, that, that's the thing. We need to find some suitable material system or we need to develop, we need to design some suitable alloy material. We can easily make them bond. We can easily store hydrogen over there. And as soon as I want, I can easily release that hydrogen. Like our mobile battery, right? We can charge it and we can discharge it easily. Similar thing, the concept, the idea is this idea. Storing hydrogen, storage is okay, but releasing hydrogen is, it's challenging from the solid state material system. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Udin? As we're coming up on one o'clock, I guess not. Uh, I would say thank you once again uh, for agreeing to uh, to give a talk for the honors program. I will in Zoom lingo give you a little applause there. 
<laughs> well done. Uh, very interesting, uh, as, as Dr. Kalam pointed out. Yeah, I mean, certainly for me, I didn't understand most of the underlying <laughs> aspects, uh, but it made sense. Uh, it, it was presented very, um, very straightforwardly. And, and so even I didn't use specialists like that much technical language I use in general so that people can easily understand. No, that's good. That's important. But I didn't uh, go too much deep in technical. I didn't go. I did. I am not showing that thing. That's that's it will probably be hard to understand. Yeah. Um, but thank you once again. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. I will go ahead and get this posted up on the YouTube channel uh, for folks who were not able to watch it in real time. And uh, everybody, from the honors standpoint, we will look forward to seeing you again for our next colloquium on the 22nd. Uh, and remember, every Thursday from 9 to 12 in University Center 254, there are free donuts and coffee for any who want to join us. So come on down. Yeah. And uh, we're going to hope to do that for the rest of the semester. So all right, folks, take care. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.